Welcome, everybody. It is a pleasure to open the third and last Japan Brazil panel of the semester. My name is Luana Geiger, and I have been collaborating as host during the more than 10 webinars resultant of the partnership between the Japan House São Paulo and the School of International Relations at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. The panels have been carefully structured in order to promote a debate with scholars and specialists from both countries on some of the most important matters in the international agenda. Therefore, we are thrilled to close the series of events with a subject that is as relevant as it gets, vaccine geopolitics. We are also delighted to host Professor Dr. Kyle Takuma from the Metropolitan University of Tokyo and Professor Dr. Oliver Stunkel from Fundação Getúlio Vargas. It is part of our protocol to highlight that all statements expressed during this event exclusively represent personal opinions and not necessarily the institutional position of Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Also, all present here agree to participate and have consented to be recorded on this broadcast, which will be later posted on FGV's official channels. The audience can send us questions during the entire event through the Slido platform. The link to the platform is on the event description here on YouTube. After the expositions, we have a few minutes to discuss and answer those questions. I will now give the floor to Professor Kai Takuma, Professor of International Politics at the Faculty of Law and Politics at Tokyo Metropolitan University. She received an MA and PhD from the University of Tokyo, and her research involves mainly global health governance, its origin, evolution, and challenges, with a focus on its relationship with the changing international political order. In this regard, she has been engaged in several projects and has been one of the main experience of the job of the topic in Japan. One of her latest papers published last year in the Asia Pacific Review touches on the need for global solidarity in order to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Takuma, thank you very much for joining us from Japan. We are looking forward to hearing from you and the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction, Rana. Uh, good morning or good evening, everyone. I'm Kayo Takuma from Tokyo Metropolitan University. Uh, first, I would like to express my deepest appreciation for everyone who organized and uh, prepared for this uh, webinar. Uh, and uh, also thank you for thank you all for taking uh, part in this uh, webinar. It's a great honor for me uh, to attend this panel as a speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me share my PowerPoint. Okay, so oh, let me e e start my presentation. Uh, let me introduce myself briefly. I have researched the history of global health governance with a focus on international uh, on its relationship with a changing international uh, order. Uh, in this uh, regard, I have been engaged in several projects such as a comparative study on G7, G7 countries' contribution to global health governance. My latest article is uh, uh, Global Solidarity is Necessary to End the COVID-19 Pandemic, which was published in the latest issue of Asia Pacific Review. Then, sorry. So uh, it has been a, a year since Dr. Tedros of WHO declared the COVID-19 infections as a pandemic. While the world is uh, hoping for a quick resolution of the infection, vaccines are the only solution that we can rely as of now. Pharmaceutical companies, including AstraZeneca, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, have successfully developed highly effective vaccines, and many developed countries, including the United States, Japan, and European countries, have already started mass immunization programs. Although this development a uh, positive sign of control over or coexistence with the COVID-19, many issues regarding the vaccines are yet to be addressed in this presentation, I would like to give an overview of the situation surrounding the COVID-19 vaccines as of now and tackle the, tackle the issue of ensuring equal access to vaccines by focusing on the role of de developed countries, uh, including Japan. In the first section, I will set forth various challenges concerning the COVID-19 vaccines. Actually, there are many challenges that must be addressed for promoting vaccination and vaccine supply in the, in the future. The first issue is highly uneven access to vaccine. 
As this chart, which I borrowed from the BBC, shows uh, there is a large gap between developed countries and developing countries regarding the number of people vaccinated. According to the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, 10 countries have administered 75% of all vaccinations, while 130 countries have not yet received a single dose of vaccines. Um, as, vac as vaccines are sold as, uh, as sold as a pharmaceutical products, the difference in purchasing power of each country creates a disparity of access. Some, some developed countries have enough vaccines to inoculate their entire population five times over. In contrast, developing countries are facing the growing crisis of financial difficulties due to the COVID-19, and without appropriate international support, they will be unable to procure vaccines. Inequality in access to medicine is a common phenomenon. For example, HIV AIDS antiviral, antiviral drugs uh, were introduced in the, in the early 1990s, but it took about seven years before they became widely available in Africa, where there are many patients. WHO's effort to ensure equitable access to vaccines of, of the uh, H5N1 influenza in 2004 failed, and the vaccines of the H1N1 influenza in 2009 were bought up by the, the, the developed countries, while only their surplus was surprised to developing countries. And the second challenge with vaccines is transportation. mRNA vaccines need to be stored at the ultra at, at ultra low temperatures of minus 70 degrees Celsius or uh, lower. And even hospitals in developed countries do not have the required facilities to store them at ultra low temperatures, let alone transporting them to remote areas. For this reason, some countries, such as Middle Eastern countries, believe that the inactive, inactivated vaccines from China would be preferable. And the third challenge is a distrust in the vaccines. It is said that the 70 to 90 percent of the population needs to acquire immunity to the virus to bring the infection under control. However, due to the hastened uh, development of the COVID-19 vaccine, the spread of fake news and politicization, there is a widespread movement in Europe and the United States to reject the vaccine. The vaccine was highly politicized in the United States, with the former US President Trump aiming to begin vaccination before the presidential election, triggering widespread distrust of vaccines among the public. In the past, there were many cases where vaccination did not occur due to concerns about the safety of new vaccines, the spread of rumors, and the lack of system for injury compensation. Unfortunately, uh, unfounded uh, ho hoax about the Ebola vaccine spread in the, in the Congo, causing hesitancy towards vaccination. The 2016 dengue fever vaccination program launched in Philippines was found to cause serious side effects, which has also negatively impacted the public attitude towards the COVID-19 vaccines. During the 2009 H1N1 influenza, developing countries did not have an established system to compensate for side effects, and there, and there are movements uh, rejecting vaccination due to side effect concerns. It is essential to ensure smooth communication between manufacturer, manufacturer, government, and the public through the disclosure of data showing safety and efficiency and careful explanation from government to the public. If the above challenges concerning the vaccines are not addressed, what will the consequence be? Actually, failure to ensure equitable access to vaccines will have several consequences from the perspective of international order. The first is that it will delay the containment of the infection and recovery of the global economy. According to a, according to a laboratory at Northeastern University in the United States, Monopolization of 2 billion doses of vaccines by the 50 industrialized countries would result in 
more than double the number of the deaths and continued infections as compared to the distribution of the vaccine in equal proportions as per the population of each country. The Eurasian group, Eurasia group also estimated through a simulation that developed countries could suffer trillions of dollars of economic losses over the next five years without equitable access to vaccines. Those research, researches show that equitable access to vaccine is necessary not only from a humanitarian perspective, but also from a practical perspective, such as con containing the outbreak and restoring the global economy as soon as possible. The second impact of inequitable access is the promotion of conflict between developing and developed countries. At the WTO meeting, India and South Africa argued that the compulsory license, license, licensing of the COVID-19 vaccine should be allowed to enable the production of affordable vaccines, while developed countries, including the UK, US, or Swiss, uh, Switzerland, uh, maintained their opposition. If the gap between developed countries where vaccination is progressing and developing countries where it is not widened in the future, there is no denying the possibility of distrust and conflict between nations. And um, the third impact of inequality in access to vaccines is the rise of China. China and Russia are exporting domestically produced vaccines to developing countries that lag behind the developed countries in securing vaccines. Vaccines are scarier than masks, and it appears that China intends to use the supply of vaccines as a diplomatic tool to extend its international influence. Last year, China signed vaccine sales contract in Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. And in December of last year, Chinese vaccines were approved in the UAE and Berlin. China is also reported to be considering setting up the vaccine manufacturing plants in Morocco and Egypt to serve as a regional supply basis. On the other hand, there is a widespread concern about the efficiency and safety of those vaccines, since sufficient data supporting safety and efficiency have not been disclosed. Uh, and if there is a problem with efficiency, it could mean that the people are being vaccinated with ineffective vaccines, which could hinder the, the effort toward the global convergence. Of the three challenges mentioned above, the first, uh, first challenge, ensuring fair access to COVID-19, is an urgent issue. In the next session, let's review the global efforts to address this problem. The COVAX facility is the first ever framework for equitable supply was established to address this issue. COVAX is a global partnership of member countries to co-finance about $20 billion to several, several candidate vaccines and uh, provide 2 billion doses of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines pre-approved by the WHO by the end of this year. Participating countries are divided into those that can secure vaccines for their uh, citizens at their own public expense and uh, those that cannot. Uh, the, uh, the former have made contribution in advance, which are used for vaccine development and manufacturing, fa manufacturing facility facilities. Okay. Since last year, um, progress has been made in various ways. Uh, for example, uh, Japan joined the COVAX program in the summer of last year and has already contributed a large sum of money. Uh, last, last month, the Japanese Minister of Foreign Affairs, Toshimitsu Motegi, announced that uh, Japan would increase its contribution to the COVAX AMC uh, to a total of uh, $200 million. At the end of last year, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the EU, Canada, and others pledged additional contributions and loans to COVAX AMC, and funds exceeded the initial, initial target were collected. The US, which did not join the COVAX under the Trump regime, has joined it under the new administration, and the first supply of COVAX, uh, uh, the first supply from COVAX was delivered to Ghana and Nigeria last month. 
Despite those progress, simply establishing a system to ensure equitable access to vaccine is not enough to deal with the challenges surrounding the vaccines. There is immense, immense uh, uncertainty about the uh, quantity of the essential vaccine that can be secured. So in the rest, last section, I would like to examine how to solve the current challenges and what role Japan is expected to play. Uh, in an international society that has discrepancy in economic and technological power, it is inevitable that um, disparities in access to the COVID-19 vaccine will arise. In particular, it is natural for countries in a crisis situation to strive to secure vaccines for their own citizens above all else. The question is how to strike a balance between securing such national interests and maintaining international public interest in the midst of this crisis. We can consider it inevitable that developed countries with superior purchasing power and technical, technological cap capabilities will gain access to vaccines earlier than others. However, we must avoid a situation where uh, the developed countries monopolize, uh, monopolize the vaccines and efforts should be made to distribute the vaccines to those who should, should be prioritized, such as medical personnel in the countries that do not have access to vaccines. Uh, it, is not in, it is important to note that, um, as, as already mentioned, that uh, this is not only from a humanitarian perspective, but, as already, but it also brings uh, the benefit of quicker convergence and economic recovery, especially for Japan, uh, who will be hosting the Olympic uh, in the summer. Equal access to vaccine is crucial to conduct a safe Olympic events. World leaders should realize this point. Uh, so, what is uh, Japan's role? I would like to propose three roles. The first is to increase the efficiency of the COVAX by convincing countries of the importance of equitable access, calling for their participation, and convening international conference to raise funds. The second is to develop an international approval system for vaccines. At present, the approval system differs. Ap approval system for uh, vaccines uh, different differs from uh, uh, country to country, and some countries approve the vaccines with little data. So it is necessary to entrust the approval approval process to a multilateral framework such as um, international organization or international panel of experts. Such a system would pave the way for utilizing not only Western vaccines, but also non-Western vaccines and help to achieve equal access to vaccine. Japan is expected to play a leading role in establishing such a system. And the third role is to make various efforts to promote vaccine, pro vaccine production and ensure equal access to vaccine. Recently, Japan, US, Australia, and India agreed to establish a cooperative framework to supply Indian vaccines to developing countries. In the proposed framework, Japan, US, and Australia finance the framework, and India will produce the vaccines and supply it to developing countries. Furthermore, Japan should promote vaccine production similar to how the Biden administration broke out a pact between Johnson & Johnson and Merck for Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine production. If Japan works toward these efforts, it would, it would greatly help the world have equal access to vaccines. So let's conclude my presentation. While, vac while vaccines are the only solution that we can rely as of now, there are various issues regarding vaccines yet to be addressed. Among all, ensuring fair access to the COVID-19 vaccine is an urgent issue. <clears throat> Failure to ensure equitable access to vaccines will have several consequences from the perspective of, the, of international order, such as the delay of the containment of the, of the infection and recovery of the global economy, and the promotion of conflict between the developing and the developed countries, and or the rise of China. The COVAX facility was established to establish to address this issue, but there is a still considerable uncertainty as to whether the, this facility functions as it should. Therefore, voluntary efforts, to develop, voluntary efforts of developed countries such as Japan are crucial. 
Uh, in summary, I propose three concrete actions that Japan must take, which are making efforts to optimize the efficiency of COVAX, developing an international approval system for vaccine, and promoting licensed pro production. That's all from my part. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Takuma. Once again, we encourage the audience to send us questions through the Slido platform. And without further ado, I introduce Dr. Oliver Stunkel, who is an associate professor and coordinator of the graduate program at the São Paulo, at the School of International Relations at Fundação Getúlio Vargas in São Paulo. He also coordinates the São Paulo branch of the School of History and Social Sciences at the Executive Program in International Relations. Professor Stunkel holds a BA from the University of Valencia in Spain, a Master in Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, and a PhD in Political Science from the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. Thank you very much, Professor Oliver. Thank you very much, uh, Luana. Good uh, evening, good morning. Uh, and also thank you so much to Professor uh, Kayo Takuma uh, it was a pleasure to, to listen to your uh, presentation and I've learned a lot. And uh, before I, I make my comments, I just would like to say that I've been uh, a long time supporter of uh, greater cooperation between Japan and Brazil. Uh, and I think that uh, as I've you know, said on other occasions, I think there's so many opportunities to strengthen the dialogue uh, between in institutions, um, educational institutions, governments, um, the private sector, and civil society. Uh, I think Brazil and perhaps Latin America as a whole is one of the regions that will struggle most in making sense of a more Asia-centric world, uh, which involves uh, an adjustment, a profound adjustment of the way that we think about international politics, the way we think about global challenges, public policy, uh, the global economy, and which requires a very sophisticated understanding of the region, which will shape our lives more than any other, which is Asia, uh, which is already the economic center of the world, uh, and which is actually also the political center of the world, but we're still um, in this process of adapting. But when you look at many of the uh, structures uh, in place in Brazil, it becomes obvious that uh, we are not yet adequately prepared to train a new elite capable of understanding and anticipating the major trends that are emerging in Asia and which will influence global affairs, including uh, politics in Brazil. And I think uh, one symbol of that is that Brazil's newspapers uh, you know, which are excellent and which are very important to sustain our democracy, uh, uh, basically uh, do not have uh, many uh, uh, correspondents in Asia, uh, but are still uh, spread around mostly uh, Europe and the United States. Uh, so we look at Asia from a uh, largely sort of uh, European perspective, uh, translate articles from uh, European or American newspapers about what's going on. Uh, in, in Asia, and these inevitably uh, will overlook a lot of the opportunities that uh, exist between Latin America and Japan. Uh, and of course, I think, um, you know, there are many opportunities, many countries uh, where uh, Brazilians can study in Asia, but I think Japan, because of its uh, democratic traditions, but also because of the excellence of its institutions, is a privileged place from where to look at Asia and from where to learn about Asia. Uh, and that's why we are very proud to have uh, a series of uh, active um, agreements and partnerships with uh, Japanese universities. And we're very, very much looking forward to deepening this kind of uh, cooperation, not only with the institutions, but also the kinds of events we've been having over the past weeks. So having said that, I would like to make uh, four uh, key points. Uh, and I think it was uh, really ideal uh, to uh, have this match, to have uh, me speak here uh, after Professor Takuma, because uh, she's an expert in uh, global health issues and has given us sort of the, the details 
of where we are going in this global effort uh, to combat the pandemic. So I would like to hear, uh, make some broader comments about the geopolitical context uh, of how to think about the situation. And the first is that this pandemic shows us that military power is not, an economic power is not uh, crucial at this stage to exert global influence. Uh, today, countries exert global influence by providing public goods. Uh, that has been also the case uh, in previous crises, for example, the uh, global financial crisis of 2008, which allowed for, uh, several emerging powers to assume a more visible global role and to exercise influence by providing the global public good, which was uh, uh, in demand at the time, which was liquidity. So Brazil, India, China, etc were able to strengthen their position in global order because not because they had you know invested greatly in their armed forces but because they had the capacity to provide Bretton Woods institutions with additional liquidity to deal with the crisis which had emerged in the United States. Uh, other ways of providing um, global goods are obviously uh, development aid and Japan uh, is a key actor uh, a key develop uh, a, a key donor country, uh, humanitarian aid, disaster aid, and at this stage of the pandemic, uh, the countries that are you know increasing their power, increasing their visibility, are the countries that are mo are acting in the most constructive way, not only in protecting their own population, but by being able to uh, provide global public goods, vaccines to um, export. Uh, protective gear to help hospitals deal with these issues to uh, finance research and share the results that help uh, other countries that don't have the same facilities to address these issues. Uh, and, you know, that uh, uh, shows that, you know, Japan in general, I think Asian countries have been very good at uh, taking care of their own populations, uh, which of course increases also their reputation uh, because there seem to be, you know, societies with a state apparatus capable of implementing measures necessary to protect their own population. Um, in that case, for example, Brazil and initially the United States has uh, suffered, uh, their reputation and influence has suffered because they were seen as not being able to address the crisis very well. And uh, as uh, Professor Takuma has already mentioned, uh, some countries are taking the next step and are providing vaccines. Now, we are in the middle of this. Uh, there's, it's too soon to say uh, who will be the countries that are capable of benefiting geopolitically most from the crisis. Um, uh, I think it's too early to say that you know China and Russia, because they've started by providing these vaccines, are the clear winners so far. But vaccine diplomacy will be the key element uh, as we seek to point out how the geopolitical uh, puzzle, it will basically be rearranged after the pandemic. And I think that uh, this is really something to watch, uh, that the provision of public, global public goods will be more crucial than ever. And the need for cooperation is also greater than ever. Now, um, the second issue is, is the question to what extent great power politics uh, undermines the international community's uh, capacity to distribute the vaccine. And I think in past moments of global crisis, uh, cooperation uh, was at times very successful, at other times less so. And one of the things I think that is worth pointing out is that compared to 2008, one of the reasons why we may not be seeing so much useful cooperation going on at this stage is that we're back into great power politics. Uh, that the, the decisive dynamic of international affairs nowadays is a very tense standoff between Washington and Beijing. Uh, and that shapes uh, the way that these countries think about global politics and even the way some other countries think about global politics, which isn't necessarily an additional incentive towards deepening cooperation. Uh, so I think we are in an environment where global uh, cooperation is becoming more difficult. Uh, we are uh, seeing, you know, a tech war. 
uh, pressure from the great powers for countries to either utilize or not utilize Chinese technology uh, in their 5G networks. Um, we are seeing the end of hyper-globalization, a uh, return of economic nationalism, uh, which reduces interdependence between countries. Um, so there's a, a challenging environment. And I think a lot of the uh, interesting economic, uh, academic studies that will be produced over the next years is to find out how can we maintain and protect cooperation and in an environment in which the two largest economies may not necessarily be so interested in promoting cooperation because they're more concerned about great power politics. And I think this is another aspect that unites Japan and Brazil because irrespective of who's in power in Japan and, and Brazil, both countries share an interest in maintaining good ties to both China and the United States. From an economic point of view, both have strong economic ties, but both also have an interest in maintaining uh, very productive ties with Washington. Uh, and in that sense, I think both countries are crucial to assure that great power politics will not dominate everything and reduce international cooperation uh, and, and create two camps which sort of don't talk to each other and create a situation in which all countries must decide whether to side with Beijing or with Washington. Uh, I think Japan, Europe also, and Brazil um, can all work towards creating an environment in which cooperation is protected from these greater geopolitical trends. And I think the development of the vaccine and, the, and what we've, we've just heard uh, um, by, by Professor Takuma is, is encouraging in a way. You know, there is cooperation taking place, uh, which is not negatively affected by great power politics. Uh, and I think this is something we need to uh, study further and need to find out what are the ways and means to assure that this cooperation can uh, function. And the quick development of the vaccine in a way is proof that you know, uh, global politics doesn't create an unsurmountable obstacle. Um, the third issue I'd just like to raise is the question of what can we learn from the situation about future challenges which are essentially global and which cannot be dealt with if we continue thinking about these challenges as nations. Now that's a problem because we are witnessing the rise of nationalism. Uh, which means that uh, there's a lot of countries which demonize international institutions, et cetera, uh, which, you know, seek to, um, you know, look to, to a point towards outside threats. We're seeing this even here in Latin America. Uh, and the question is, how can we overcome these trends? Because COVID respects obviously no borders and vaccinating your own population entirely and not helping others may not be sufficient to protect yourself. Because first of all, even if you try to vaccinate everybody, you're probably only going to reach about 80 or 90%. And because you cannot close your country forever, part of your population, even though you've reached herd immunity, may, be, uh, may come in contact with people who enter the country from abroad. So you have an active interest in, vac in making sure that the entire world population is vaccinated also because the risk of the emergence of vi uh, variants that are resistant to vaccines increases if we have countries where the, the pandemic rages in an uncontrolled fashion. So, and it, you know, a lot of people are afraid of the situation that's going on in Brazil right now. We, we uh, could see the emergence, and I hope obviously this will not be the case, but we could see the emergence of further uh, variants in Brazil, which could uh, reduce the effective, uh, effectiveness of uh, vaccines being applied abroad. That means that even countries that are exceptionally well prepared and fast at vaccinating everybody else can only be safe and only be capable of protecting their own publications, uh, populations uh, once they're capable also of distributing the vaccine globally. And that has significant consequences for the concept of sovereignty. Because uh, what happens inside Brazil is not only a business of Brazil, but it's the business of all countries in the world which are concerned 
about the pandemic. And I think that uh, that will, there's a great field of study here for, for international relations specialists of how countries, for example, should react uh, to a leader uh, or a government which uh, is not vaccinating its uh, population fast enough, which is not taking all the steps necessary. Uh, you know, this is an issue that uh, I think uh, raises many, many fascinating questions, urgent questions about how we can also uh, influence uh, affairs in other countries uh, that are falling behind in the combat against the, the pandemic. And finally, I think that the study of international cooperation in the context of the pandemic teaches us a lot of things about the next biggest challenge that the international community is facing, which is climate change. And in many ways, there's interesting parallels uh, as we think about the two challenges, because just like the vaccine, getting your, your own house in order will not be enough because it's necessary to uh, engage the entire uh, human uh, international community uh, uh, in order to avoid the uh, negative effects of rising temperatures, uh, which means that if Japan uh, becomes carbon neutral uh, over the next 15 years, it will not be enough. If the United States becomes carbon neutral, it will not be enough. Even if China only becomes carbon neutral, it will not be enough. It needs to take other countries along. And uh, when one country like Brazil or Indonesia uh, or France is falling behind, it's something that affects all of them and which can be also just like the pandemic be seen as a threat to their national interest, which also has a tremendous impact on uh, the concept of sovereignty, creating an imperative to rethink and strengthen uh, ways for nations to work together because there's no other choice. Uh, both the pandemic and climate change are problems and challenges uh, which do not allow us to collaborate or not. They, uh, they are basically force us to uh, collaborate. And I think that uh, is, these are two incentives which despite all the obstacles uh, provide us uh, perhaps and hopefully with a necessary push in order to uh, deal successfully, not only with the pandemic, but also with climate change. So I'll stop here and uh, one, once more uh, thank uh, you for the invitation to this event. Luana. Thank you very much, Professor Oliver. We have a few questions from our audience. And I will start with a couple of questions to Professor Takuma. Uh, we have uh, two very similar questions. I think we can, they're very straight to the point and very similar. Therefore, I think we can combine them in a pair. Um, so Professor Takuma, um, how can the unequal distribution of vaccine, vaccines among developed and developing countries affect global health security, taking into account the new virus mutations and variants? And the second one, Considering that vaccine rollout and production has been pretty slow worldwide, and that Western countries, which developed and controlled the technology, um, are engaging in what has been called vaccine nationalism, would you agree with the claims of the WHO Director General Tedros that the world is on the brink of a catastrophic moral fa failure when it comes to equal with vaccine distribution? Thank you. Thank you, Verna. Uh, so regarding the first question, uh, I think the unequal distribution will have a huge impact on the uh, on the you know global health security in a negative term. <clears throat> there is no as Professor uh, Professor uh, Oliver uh, uh, pointed out that, that there is no no border regarding the virus. Uh, so uh, therefore, if the new variants, new variants uh, are developed in the countries that uh, have not secured enough vaccines, and these uh, new variants uh, will come and spread into the uh, countries where most uh, most people were vaccinated. For now, uh, vaccines from AstraZeneca or Pfizer are said to be effective to any variant, uh, any uh, new variants. But I think uh, there is a possibility that uh, uh, you know that uh, the new variant Will, will evolve in the future, uh, to which is uh, the existing vaccine are not effective. 
Uh, so I think that to, in order to tackle the virus, which can easily cross the border, uh, it is necessary to control it, not on the country level, but on a global level. Therefore, uh, world leaders should realize uh, this point uh, at this point, and uh, yeah, I think that uh, no place is safe unless the world is safe. And regarding the second question, uh, I cannot agree more with Dr. Tedros Crane. Uh, in an international society, in, in an international society that has that has um, discrepancy in economic and technological power, it is inevitable that uh, some countries get access to vaccines earlier than others. In particular, it is natural uh, uh, for country in, in such a crisis situation to prioritize its own interests above all else. The question is how to strike a balance between uh, securing such a national interest and uh, uh, you know, like securing the uh, public health interest. So unfortunately, the reality is that uh, most developed countries prioritize their own interests above all else, and developing countries are suffering from the distortion produced by such selfish act. Yeah, I do not uh, intend to uh, defend such selfish act, but as a political scientist, I have to explain the background for this selfish, uh, selfish act. Besides the virus uh, representing an emergency for every nation, uh, most developed countries are democratic. Most developing developed countries, including Japan, are democratic countries where a ruling uh, ruling government cannot keep their shit without uh, the people's support. And actually, uh, you know that in Japan, where uh, the general general election uh, will take place in this autumn, the Suga administration uh, wants to inoculate as many as people uh, possible, as many as many people as possible before the Olympic and make the Olympic successful. And Germany, which is also expecting the general election this summer, has um, the same expectation towards the vaccine. So that's partly explain why developed countries are uh, caught up in securing their, their own vaccines. But even though the, the um, even though I think that the world leaders should realize that, that their national interests are closely linked to the international situation uh, of the the international situation of the, the vaccine distribution and um, involve themselves uh, in such efforts as increasing eff efficiency of COVAX or promoting uh, licensed production. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Takuma now to Professor Olivet. Um, we have seen a general undermining or sometimes rejection of some countries' vaccine production uh, in a prejudicial manner. Um, how can that be harmful to overcoming the pandemic? Well, I think that um, I'm, I'm not quite, I mean, there, there's, there's several processes obviously uh, going on. I think that uh, at this stage, there's a there's several difficult debates going on. One of them is, of course, uh, how to uh, deal with patents, uh, because a lot of investment has gone also into uh, the development of these uh, uh, of these vaccines, and to what extent uh, it should be allowed to uh, uh, to you know to to multiply the places in which the, the vaccine can be produced. Now, I think that uh, one thing that we've seen is. Uh, that uh, the more uh, health and public health agencies can work together uh, to share information about the safety of uh, vaccines, uh, the better, uh, because it increases also confidence in uh, the types of, uh, in the vaccines that are being applied and reduce the risk uh, that, you know, parts of the uh, population uh, have no confidence uh, in specific vaccines uh, due to their origin. Uh, so I think that uh, as much as these processes can be streamlined, uh, the better uh, in order to have um, global platforms where information about uh, the uh, safety of vaccines, but also the types of production uh, can be pooled uh, in order to uh, avoid that shortfalls or problems in one specific country have an impact on a larger set of, uh, of countries around the world. Thank you, Professor. Uh, next question to Professor Takuma. 
considering that the WHO doesn't have authority to act unilaterally and that propositions to strengthen the institution have raised concerns uh, that it might erode state sovereignty, how can the WHO improve in order to tackle pandemics or other health threats in the future? Thank you. Okay, uh, I think that that's a very important question. I think uh, WHO's ability to tackle the present uh, pandemic and the future pandemic uh, will be improved through two, uh, two uh, measures. The first measure is the WHO's efforts to regain the international trust. The, the, since the last year, WHO has issued uh, various recommendations and guidelines uh, in order to tackle the virus, which unfortunately uh, were not carried were not put into practice because they were disappointed with the WHO and uh, um, you know lost trust to the, the organization. So uh, on, on the other hand, uh, it is also true that um, there is an expectation for the uh, organization to initiate the, the coordinating the action of, of various stakeholders in order to uh, tackle this virus. For example, uh, at the, the you know, w, w, World Health uh, WHO's, general, WHO's executive committee held in January of this year, um, member countries made a lot of requests uh, to WHO, such as developing a common standard for a vaccine certificate, or uh, you know taking a lead in ensuring equal access to vaccine. So uh, I think that the, the first measure is to regain the WHO's efforts to regain the, the, the international trust. And the second measure is to improve WHO's uh, ability uh, the, the second, you know, the second measure is the the efforts of international society. Some expert uh, said that um, stated that WHO is uh, akin to a vehicle for international society. So the choice of whether to suitably drive the vehicle, or resolve its uh, breakdowns, or destroy it, all depends on international society. So uh, I think that um, uh, it all depends on the member states. So all the international efforts to, uh, you know, to improve the WHO is necessary. Unfortunately, it's um, now the US and China uh, uh, as the confrontation continues, but I think the role of middle powers such as Japan is um, getting higher. Thank you so much, Professor Takuma. Um, next question to Professor Oliver. Um, even though uh, economic power is not needed to a government to instruct it, its people, uh, the developed countries can offer more global public goods. And the question is uh, whether this favors uh, developed countries. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, to some extent, yes. But uh, on the other hand, I think, for example, India will emerge uh, throughout the next chapter of this pandemic as a key provider of the vaccine, uh, a country that uh, has a tremendous uh, uh, productive capacity um, where a lot of vaccines are being produced. Uh, and the uh, CEO of CEOs of several Indian companies are now decisive in assuring uh, the ramp up of, of the vaccines. Of course, developed countries uh, tend to be uh, able to invest more in, in research and development. But, uh, you know, uh, even China, which uh, in many ways is still a developing country, uh, has also been able to, um, you know, send vaccines abroad. Um, and I think that you know, if this particular government, uh, Brazil, I think has not seen the pandemic as an opportunity or an, uh, a moment in which it could provide global public goods. But in the past, uh, Brazil has played a leading role. Uh, uh, like, for example, uh, as I've mentioned, as uh, um, it, about 20 years ago, working together with India and South Africa, uh, to accelerate the production of generics uh, as the world was, was facing the HIV AIDS crisis. Uh, and those were also developing countries. So I think that uh, there, that, you know, the case of India, of China, uh, and of Brazil 20 years ago does show 
that uh, it is possible as a developing country to provide global public goods and, and be recognized uh, for, for doing that. There's many other areas where uh, developing countries provide global public goods, be it um, you know, ch uh, um, peacekeeping troops. You know, uh, many developing countries are crucial providers in, in peacekeeping troops. Brazil led until uh, a decade ago a peacekeeping mission, a very challenging peacekeeping mission in, in Haiti. And Brazil and Japan have, through trilateral cooperation, uh, been able to provide uh, development aid uh, to, to numerous African countries uh, uh, through JICA and uh, Fiocruz. Uh, there have been projects, uh, particularly in the 2000s, implemented in that sense. So uh, while it is, of course, true that developed countries have more cash, uh, I think many examples show us that if applied correctly uh, in the most productive way, uh, developing countries can also uh, provide a tremendous amount of uh, public goods and thus ex uh, increase their power and influence in global affairs. Thank you, Professor. Another question to Ms. Takuma. Um, what were the main strategies and actions conducted by the Japanese government in order to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, since last year, the number of patients uh, in Japan has relatively low in comparison with the other countries. I think uh, it, it seems uh, uh, while, while the four prefecture, four, four prefectures, including Tokyo, are still under emergency, but uh, the number of patients are uh, relatively controlled in Japan. I think uh, the two major factors are related to uh, the, you know, due the, to, to the relatively controlled number of patients. The first factor is the existing health system. You know, in Japan, uh, in the, uh, Japan, uh, you know, I'm sorry, uh, Japan has achieved a full coverage of public health insurance in 1961. And uh, thanks to this uh, system, uh, people can uh, get access to tests and uh, treatment regardless, regardless of their income level. And um, furthermore, Japan followed the WHO's recommendation, uh, test to isolate and treat. Uh, quite obediently uh, using public health centers called uh, Hokenjo. Uh, they, uh, they traced and uh, found uh, cross, contact, cross contact persons and uh, uh, which contributed uh, to the control, which, con which uh, contributed to controlling the virus. Such a system would partially explain the relatively controlled, controlled number of patients in Japan. And the second factor uh, would be the 3C policy. Since last year, Japanese government has recommended its people or to prevent 3C setting. I mean that uh, closed place, crowded uh, places, and close contact settings, rather than recommending uh, social distancing. And the 3C policies uh, turned out to be very effective uh, controlling the virus because the, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 virus spreads in the 3C settings. And um, the 3C setting, 3C policy is called Sammitsu in Japanese, which is very catchy and it has been put into practice by many Japanese. Uh, Japan shared this policy with WHO, which now recommends the world to prevent 3C. On the other hand, uh, you know, that the COVID-19 taught Japan a lot of lessons. Uh, one of them is the unorganized medical system. While Japan has controlled the uh, while the Japan has, has controlled the number of patients, uh, the major hospitals are reported to be overburdened, overburdened to uh, overburdened uh, with taking care of the COVID nineteen patients. Uh, you know that, that, that the number of patients of serious conditions at around fifty five zero, but um, the major hospitals are reported to be overburdened to taking care of uh, with taking care of the, the patients. So this is partly because the hospitals, the Japanese hospi hospitals, especially the university university hospitals, are. Uh, too independent to conform to governmental command. So I think that Japan should review its medical and command system, especially in time of uh, emergency. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Professor. And now we will take our last question to Professor Oliver. Um, Professor Stunkel, when comparing our approach to how Japan handled the pandemic, in your opinion, how could Brazil have handled the situation better or which were the main mistakes? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I think that, uh, uh, I think several issues are important. And these are not only important looking back, but also looking towards the future. Because I think that uh, there is now sufficient uh, research uh, being done to allow us to say that increased environmental destruction increases the potential for future pandemics, uh, which could be a new virus, but <clears throat> which could also be uh, bacteria. There's um, uh, coincidentally, my research about BRICS countries has uh, led me to be acquainted with the work of Jim O'Neill, who's a former Goldman Sachs banker, and who after uh, stopping his research on emerging powers is now or has for many years worked with the British government on public health issues and pandemics and he has commissioned uh, and published a report on the risk of bacteria that is uh, resi uh, resistant to antibiotics and uh, has for years spoken about this risk that we uh, must strengthen the uh, international capacity to confront global health challenges. Uh, so what I'm saying, I think, is not only referring to this pandemic, but also towards the likelihood to monitor and prevent uh, and combat the future, uh, the potential of future pandemics. And that is above all, I think, to um, not politicize uh, these issues and, and really uh, treat these as, you know, public uh, uh, administration, public policy challenges which are not about uh, left and right, uh, which are not about um, you know, w w where the research has been produced, but which are really about creating the conditions to allow um, health experts to do their work. Uh, and from what I can tell, Japan was very successful in that because this was the, the, the issue about the pandemic uh, was much less politicized than uh, in Brazil. It wasn't really about, you know, the left wanted something and the right wanted something. This was really a nation capable of, of coming together and addressing this, which doesn't mean that mistakes uh, can be avoided. They're always, you know, in these unpredictable situations, uh, this occurs. But I think the most important thing is to create an environment in which health experts uh, can be heard uh, and in which there is, uh, you know, there's an active fight against the spread of fake news uh, to allow these experts to reach policymakers and which allows policymakers to reach uh, for, uh, citizens without uh, interference. Uh, the second thing is, and I think in that case also Japan has been quite successful, is that uh, Japan, Japanese uh, diplomacy uh, assures that uh, Japan has uh, very constructive relations with the vast majority of countries around the world. Uh, so the country didn't have to uh, pay the price for having negatively uh, impacted its relationship to uh, other countries in the world uh, because of political issues and, and which negatively affected its capacity to collaborate or gain access to vaccines. So you know, treating this as, as, a, as a technical challenge, allowing experts to reach policymakers and assure that the country is on good terms with the major actors on the international stage so that these, this kind of international cooperation isn't troubled by some kind of politicization of the relationship. I think those are really key issues. And we've seen, for example, during the pandemic, a change of government in the United States which radically changed the quality of our relationship to the United States. Now, uh, that shouldn't be like that, right? Uh, for example, the relationship that Japan had to the United States was virtually unaffected by a change of government in Washington because it is a, it's a very stable relationship. So I think that diplomatic part is also absolutely crucial uh, to explain why 
uh, Japan has been so successful in dealing with this and other countries less so. As we approach the end of this webinar, we thank very much both professors for the enriching debate and also our viewers for joining us during many occasions and participating with questions. They have also contributed to the quality of the discussions. I also thank Japan House São Paulo for the collaboration in the organization of all the webinars. And I wish everyone a great night. Thank you very much. <laughs>